Thanks, everyone, for coming to the uh, ESE PhD Student Colloquium. Uh, today, uh, today's talk uh, should definitely be a good one. Uh, this <coughs> the uh, speaker is Santiago Segura, who did his uh, undergraduate degree in uh, industrial engineering back in uh, Argentina at uh, ITBA uh, in, in 2011. And then he's uh, been at uh, Penn uh, since working with Alejandro Rivero. And today, he's going to be uh, uh, sharing some of his recent work on graph signal processing. So without further ado, I'll put you up the floor. Great. Thank you, Alec, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for being here. As Alec said, my name is Santiago Segarra, and today I'm going to talk to you about graph signal processing. In particular, how can graph signal processing help our understanding of diffusion dynamics and distributed networking problems? I would like to thank, first, my advisor, Alejandro Ribeiro, and also the other collaborators in this set of works, Antonio Marquez from the University of Rey Juan Carlos in Spain, Herd Leus from TU Delft in the Netherlands, and Gonzalo Mateos from the University of Rochester. So undoubtedly, we are in an era of networks. Right? We have social networks. The whole internet is a network. We have smart grids, you name it. And with this, we have tons of network data. And our desire would be to process, analyze, and learn from network data. In order to do this, we first formalized networks as graphs, okay, just these mathematical entities where we have a set of nodes or vertices V and a set of edges encoding pairwise relationships between the nodes. And in this talk, our interest won't be in analyzing the graphs, but rather data associated to the graph. And we'll call that data a graph signal. For example, we can have a social network that will be the underlying graph and we have an opinion profile on top of this graph. So the opinion profile would be the signal, which we are element of interest here. Or we would have a brain. Okay? So we can model a brain as a network where every neural region is a node, and you have connections between these regions. But on top of this graph, you can have a signal. For example, brain activity. So the guy might have a type of signal when he's thinking about food, okay? and another type of signal when he's thinking about work. And we can uh, try to study these two signals with a common underlying graph, which is the brain. Okay? So the philosophy of graph signal processing is mainly to extend tools originally conceived to analyze signals in regular domains, like time signals or images, to extend these tools to analyze signals in more irregular domains, like graphs. And our contention is that GSP, graph signal processing, is well suited to study network processes. So why would anyone care to embark in this endeavor of extending these tools to graphs? Well, because there's a lot to win here. I mean, people have been successfully applying signal processing to audio, image, and video during decades. And we have the chance to translate part of that success into graph signals, okay? So my one, one, one might want to compress a signal. So is it possible to compress an opinion profile in a social network? Yes, it is possible. We just need to understand exactly how and what are the limitations, right? We've been denoising images for a while, right? We, we can filter that image to take the blurry away. Can we denoise a brain signal in a graph, in a, in a brain graph? Yes, we can. We just have to understand it uh, better. Also, we have new problems here. For example, semi-supervised learning. So one can think of the graph here. The graph is the red structure. You can think that there is a signal in the whole graph, but you can only observe just a few elements here, which are the blue bars. And you want to extend, to interpolate, to reconstruct the whole signal. Okay? That should uh, ring a bell there in semi-supervised learning, where you have like just a couple of labels in the graph, and you want to infer the rest of the labels. So we'll see that actually signal processing has something to say to this more <coughs> machine learning problem. But in all the things that I said, there is a, an underlying assumption, sort of like an assumption zero. Uh, there should be some relation between the underlying topology of the graph and the signal we are studying. Okay? If these two things are completely unrelated, then there is no hope to leverage the structure of the graph in order to do something with the signal. Okay? OK, so the agenda for today is just a little bit of motivation, which hopefully you're already well motivated to understand graph signal processing. Then uh, I'm going to introduce a few uh, building blocks of what graph signal processing is, so graph signal processing 101 here. And then we will delve into two particular problems, 
sampling and blind identification, which are problems to which we have contributed, and that I believe are uh, good examples to illustrate the basic concept of graph signal processing, and then just finish with concluding remarks on future research avenues. So, of course, the main element of graph signal, processes, uh, signal processing are graph signals. Okay, like we said, if we're given a graph, then a graph signal is just a mapping from the set of nodes to the set of reals. Okay, so we just attach a little real number to every node, and we can, of course, represent them as vectors. Okay, so say that we have this graph here, the nodes are the circles, the edges of the graph are the dotted red lines, and on top of the graph we have this blue signal, right? And then we just say, okay, this blue signal, we can put it as a, as a vector where we say, okay, the first, the ith element of this vector corresponds, corresponds to the signal value of the ith node in the graph, okay? That's simple enough. <laughs> then we have the graph shift operator. So we said that somehow we need to relate the signal with the underlying graph. So the graph shift operator is the one that will capture the structure of the underlying graph. This is just a matrix of size n by n, where n is the amount of nodes, and this matrix inherits the sparsity of the graph, okay? So we will say that the Sij must be zero if it is an off-diagonal element and does not correspond to an edge in the graph, okay? So for this simple example here, S12 can or cannot be zero, right? But S13 must be zero because there's no edge between one and three, okay? So in this way, S is a local operator and admissible choices of S, for example, the adjacency, the Laplacian matrix of the graph, etc. Why do I call S a shift? Seems kind of arbitrary. <laughs> well, the idea is that it resembles time shifts in discrete signal processing. And this point here is crucial to uh, the understanding of the rest of the talk, so uh, please pay attention here. So there is a point of contact between the general theory of graph signal processing and the theory of discrete signal processing. And that point of contact is that graph over there. Why? Because we can think of discrete time signals as graph signals defined on this particular graph, where each node represents a discrete time instant. Okay? These are discrete time cyclic signals, of course, because if not, it would be an infinite line. Okay? But let's, for simplicity, think of discrete time cyclic signals. Okay? So you can think of a time signal as defined in this kind of graph. So now we're gonna develop a theory for more general graphs. But whenever we specialize that theory for this particular graph, we should be able to recover the results of traditional signal processing. You see, the, the, that's, the, that's the match, the point of contact between the two things. And if you look at the adjacency matrix of this graph, is this adjacency matrix over here, and when you apply it to any signal, what you get is just a shifted version. So S is just the time delay for this particular signal, it's a time shift. So for a general signal, for a general graph, excuse me, we cannot call it time shift because there's no time, it's a graph shift, that's why we call it that way. And in the same way that delays are a building block of filters in, in signal processing, here S will be a building block of graph signal processing algorithms. Okay, notice that S is a linear operator. Why? Yes. So the shift operator, that's uh, something additional that you have to comply with the graph. It's not, it cannot be from the graph, no? Uh, well, yeah, that, that depends. So it's an additional element. It depends on your problem, if it will be given, or we have to infer it or something, but it is an additional part, so it, yes, it is additional. Um, so S is a linear operator, why? Because it's a matrix, of course it's linear, and can be computed locally. Why can it be computed locally? Because say that you, you have Y, which is S times X, and you want to compute the ith element of Y. Well, then you only need to know the ith element of X and the elements of X in the one-home neighborhood of node I. Right? Uh, for, no, right? for example, if you want to compute here Y3, of course that's this row times this column, and here, the elements that do not correspond to the one-hop neighborhood will have zeros, so you don't care what the value of x, one, five, and six are, one, five, and six, because they are farther away than one-hop neighborhood from, from three, right? So in that sense, it is local. What if you want to compute a square x? Well, then you need information, your two-hop neighborhood, and so on and so forth. 
Okay, the graph Fourier transform, we talk about graph signals, graph shifts. So graph Fourier transform, here bear with me with one second, it will look kind of arbitrary what I'm doing, but it does make sense. Say that you have this matrix S, you can find the eigen decomposition, right? Assuming it's diagonalizable, you can find the eigen decomposition, right? So here V is a matrix where the columns are the eigenvectors of S, lambda is a diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues, and we will claim, and we will call it, we will define it, the graph Fourier transform is V inverse. Okay, so if you have a signal X and you want to find its frequency representation, X tilde, I'm telling you, you just have to multiply it by V inverse. Okay, sort of arbitrary so far. If you want to go back, of course, since V is unitary, just multiply by V, and then you go back to the graph domain. Okay. So from this, from this equation, you can see that the eigenvectors, right, are actually sort of play the role of a frequency basis, right, because in this multiplication, you're just doing a linear combination of the columns of B, so you're writing X as a linear combination of these eigenvectors, as you can write a signal as a linear combination of a frequency basis. However, if you focus on the directed cycle, okay, again, in this directed cycle, V inverse is exactly the DFT matrix, okay, the discrete Fourier transform matrix, okay. So for that particular cycle, when you go into the frequency domain, you apply the DFT. For more general graphs, we claim that you have to apply this V inverse, okay? And the last thing is what a filter is, okay? So a filter is just a map between signals, so we go from Rn to Rn, and we'll ask this map to be linear, so we can represent it as a matrix, as by n by n matrix, and more specifically, we'll look at filters that can be written as a polynomial on S, okay? Polynomial on S, in this case a polynomial of degree L on S. Why do we do this? Okay, for two reasons. The first one, which is sort of maybe elegant and aesthetic to make it like a closing the theory, is because in discrete signal processing, we know how to handle linear time invariant systems, okay? Here, time invariance doesn't exist. What exists is uh, shift invariance because the time operator uh, is analogous to our shift operator here. And something being shift invariant means that if you have a signal and you shift it and then you filter it, it should be the same as having a signal, filtering it, and then shifting it. Right? So in terms of matrix, you need H and S to commute, and it can be shown that the only way for S and H to commute is for H to be a polynomial on S. Okay? The more practical reason of why we are interested in this kind of H's is that they are still local operators. Okay? You can, uh, you, can apply, uh, you can implement them locally, depending on the degree of L, of course. But if you have a massive network and you want to apply a filter of degree three, then it means that each node can apply it locally by knowing the information in its three-hop neighborhood. Right? Because what we said before, that S is a local operator, and it's just summing different operations of S. <laughs> Great, so now we can write a filter, so we know that we can, of course, write the eigen decomposition of S. We can write a filter using the, that eigen decomposition in this way, so here we have a diagonal matrix. <laughs> and what if we have a filter signal Y, which is equal HX, and we write that in the frequency domain? It means that we have that Y tilde, remember it's the inverse Y, is equal to this diagonal matrix, that so we can write this as the diagonal of some vector, H tilde, times X tilde. And this is nice, right, because the diagonal of a vector times a vector is just an element-wise product. So this means that the kth frequency of y <coughs> is just a multiplication of the kth frequency of x and the kth frequency response of the filter. There's no cross-information across frequencies, which is nice. And if you look at this expression long enough, you can realize that h tilde can actually be written as a matrix times h where h is a vector containing the filter coefficients h sub l, okay? And that matrix has this form over here, okay? These, these lambdas are the eigenvalues of s, and it is van der Monde, and being van der Monde is actually very, very important. You'll see why in a second. Here, a word of caution, and this is actually a very interesting curiosity, if you want. So I told you that for to, to transform signals into the frequency domain, just apply V inverse, right? That's the GFT. But to transform, uh, actually, a filter response to the frequency domain, I'm telling you to apply psi. Okay, but in signal processing, you do this applying the DFT both times. I mean, but what's going on here is that there's a huge coincidence, okay, that for the particular graph of the dialectic cycle, 
these two matrices, which one depends on the eigenvectors of S, and the other one depends on the eigenvalues of S, both of them are the same, and they are the DFT. Okay? For general graphs, we have this decoupling, and uh, of course this brings consequences in the theory, okay? but that's a good thing to have in mind. And just here, uh, so this is a timely and growing field. It is hard to go to a signal processing conference and not hear a lot of graph signal processing uh, talks. These are just a few fields. Uh, you'll see that most of the works are post-2013. The idea is that in 2013 there were a couple of uh, seminal works that boosted the interest in this area. And uh, a lot of people got into there, like we did, and started uh, writing stuff. So, Okay, so now that uh, you're all uh, experts in graph signal processing, we're gonna delve into two particular problems. The first one, as I said, is uh, sampling. So sampling is probably, sampling, uh, of course, reconstruction after sampling, is probably a cornerstone inverse problem in classical signal processing. So the idea is you have a signal of size n, and you would like to reconstruct this signal by having only p observations. Okay? Of course, you need some kind of model of the signal, because if the signal is completely random, there's no way of inferring the rest of the observations. Yes? Okay, okay. To understand that, we need to understand what a band-limited signal is. Right? So we're getting there in a second. So now we're understanding something. So a low pass, exactly, would be a filter that only lets pass the low frequencies, so we need to understand what the unlimited signal is. Okay, thanks. Uh, <laughs> perfect timing. So our focus will be on unlimited signals. Okay, one we have other, other models of uh, parsimonious representation of signals, we focus on unlimited signals just because in time it has been very useful. Uh, so mathematically, we'll see what the intuition is. But mathematically, it just means that x tilde, the frequency representation, is a sparse vector. Okay, so that x can be represented by just using a few frequency frequencies from the frequency basis. Um, I mean, people have some preferences of what s should be. We will be just agnostic to this, okay, and 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 de develop this just for a general s, and then you can pick the s that you like. Um, we we'll see that there are three reasonable ways of sampling graph signals. Okay. One we call selection sampling, one aggregation sampling, and one space shift that actually mix the other two. And let me go into detail one second about this. Selection sampling is probably the most intuitive way to extend sampling into graph signals. And the, the idea is the following. Okay, you have a graph, there is a signal defined on the whole graph, and you will just pick a subset of the nodes and observe the signal in that subset of the nodes, and with that information, you would like to extend the signal to the rest of the graph, okay? Yeah. Simple enough, so you have a graph, just observe a couple of nodes, you would like to infer the signal in the rest of the graph. Well, formulating that, it's, it's, not, it's not very hard, so you have a signal X, and then we're gonna have a fat binary matrix C, that will be a selection matrix, and that will give us X bar, which is just like P values of X, P, the quantity p has nothing to do with statistics. Uh, and then the idea would be to recover x from x bar, okay? Um, so we assume, now, give me one second, we assume, right, that this, this, is band this signal is band-limited in order to be able to recover it, and we assume that we know the support. Say that the first k frequencies are active and the rest n minus k are not. So if we can recover x tilde k, which are the first k values, we already know that all of the other ones are zero, and we can recover x perfectly. Okay? So then you just massage a little bit here and there. It's actually kind of simple. And you get to this expression where you can have x in terms of x bar. Okay? The thing here is that in between you have a matrix inverse. Okay? And let me tell you what this matrix inverse is. So vk are the first k columns of v, so are the active frequencies. Okay, and C chooses rows from that from that uh, tall matrix. You choose k rows from a tall matrix to have a square matrix that you need to invert. So C has to do with which nodes you sample. So say that you sample node one, twenty-four, and seventy-two. Okay, then this C will choose rows one, twenty-four, and seventy-two from that matrix. Okay? And you need that matrix to be invertible, and there's no way to check a priori if this matrix is going to be invertible or not. Okay? So there is this combinatorial problem that was not present in something in time, and we'll see why, that you have it here. So 
there's no way of a priori saying which is going to be a good set of nodes to sample in order to further reconstruct the signal. Okay? <laughs> and the corners of these are the interpolators. Uh, we'll see that when this is actually time, okay, when we are in time and we were in the di directed cycle, this matrix over there is van der Mond. Actually, it's a Fourier matrix. So you're guaranteed that this thing is invertible. So you don't have to worry about it. You just do uniform sampling, and you know that if the thing is unlimited, you recover it perfectly. But this is why, I mean, at an algebraic level. And actually, it's interesting enough that if you look at the columns of this thing, they are discrete sinks in time, so that sinks are perfect interpolators. Interesting. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, the sampling part. So, um, so, so in this sampling scheme, right, you have a, a graph. Okay, you have a signal on the whole graph, which you know a priori that this is band limited. So it has a parsimonious representation in this uh, frequency domain. <coughs> so since it is band limited in that, in that domain, maybe you can pick just a few values of the graph, say k, if it has a k representation, k of them, and from them, from that, infer the rest of the graph signal. The thing is that if you do that in this way, with that we call selection sampling, there is no way of telling a priori, without actually picking the values and computing that matrix, if the, if the places where you sample are actually good places to reconstruct the whole signal or not. It's not that you can always reconstruct it. You need, yes? This formula that you wrote down there, the X equal to the yeah. Yeah. Is, that, is that the maximum, the maximum likelihood estimate of the missing value? Here, since since we are picking exactly k, uh, yes, it is so it is solving the the linear. So here you have k equations and k k k unknowns and k equations. So it's solving that uh, linear set of equations. Yes, and there, yeah, there, there's no there's no prior knowledge or anything of that kind. Mm -hmm. But yes. Yes, yes, yes. That that is the thing because the whole concept of rate in time makes sense, right? Because there is there is something called uniform sampling, which is okay. You put one, three, five, seven, whatever, because there is a linear ordering of the nodes. In general graph, you lose completely that linear ordering. So doing uniform sampling is unclear, and so sampling rate is also unclear. Well, uh, so, <laughs> so relating invertibility of this matrix with topological properties of the graph is something that is uh, very hard and no one has done yet. Well, yes, uh, it should go some. So in the cases where you have regularity, then you can make these kind of claims. In, for more general cases, you can't. OK, so the, another way of sampling graphs, signals, graph signals, is aggregation sampling. So here what you do is something different. So you start with signal x, okay? But then you start applying this uh, graph shift operator, okay? this inherent operation in the graph, to start forming this uh, sequence of signals y super l, okay? And then you sit at a node i and look at the values of the signals y super l that you observed, okay? So this is like this. So I'm node i, I live in this graph. First, there is a signal in the graph, so I just observe my value. Okay, so I have x sub i, which we call y0 sub i. And then we start applying this graph shift operator s, and I just only record the values that I see, okay? I see locally. And then the question is, can I, being a single node, recover the whole graph signal, the whole x, by sampling the things that I saw? Okay, not sampling the graph at different points, but standing in one point and applying the shift sim uh, su successively. Right? Uh, okay, so then the idea would be let's sample this. So you use a selection matrix. Here the math is just a little bit more complicated, so I, I won't walk you through. But the idea is that you get to an expression <coughs> where you can recover x from y bar i. Okay, x from y bar i. In the middle, you still have a uh, an inverse matrix, which looks more uh, messy, or messier, uh, but it's actually easier because it's very highly structured. Because we need to compute an inverse of a diagonal matrix, with this matrix to be invertible, we just need the elements to be different from zero, and that's easy to check. 
And here, the matrix that we have, since psi is Vandermond, we have a Vandermond matrix. So for a Vandermond matrix to be full rank, we just need the bases to be different from each other. So then we know that this vector, which, I mean, it doesn't matter the format, the idea is that it depends on the node i where we are aggregating. So here we have a condition that depends on the node that we are aggregating. We just need a few values to be different from zero, okay? So if we want to pick a good node, we just look in the matrix, okay, which, which node doesn't have zeros here, okay, this is a good node to aggregate information into. And this condition, the first k eigenvalues being different, is something that depends on the graph. So not on the node where we are picking, but on the graph. So we say, okay, this graph uh, supports this kind of sampling, and in this graph, if you want to do this kind of sampling, you're lost, okay? So you can a priori tell which graph and within each graph which node is a good node to do aggregation sampling, okay? So we see that here we actually inherit some of the good parts of uh, sampling in time, which is this van der Mond structure. We inherit it through this matrix psi, okay? Uh, and very importantly, if we actually pick the first k observations that we have, so remember that we are we having all these observations and we're going to pick k, say that we pick the first k, this thing here is telling us that we can reconstruct the whole signal, okay? Not just the signal in my k-hop neighborhood. The whole signal in the graph, I can reconstruct it from k local uh, observations. So this means that our unlimited signal in graphs must be interpreted, and this is actually not how they are interpreting right now in a lot of uh, the literature, but must be interpreted as a signal that can be well estimated within a neighborhood. Okay? So again, if a signal is k unlimited, then it means that just by standing in my point and with information in my k-hop neighborhood, k minus one hop neighborhood, I can recover the whole signal. Okay? Uh, <laughs> this, this you're assuming that the graph is fully connected. Yes, you're assuming that the graph is fully connected, yes. Thanks, yes. To apply that inverse locally, you need to know that inverse depends on the code. It, it depends, that, that, that's a very good question, exactly. It depends on the graph, but not on the graph signal, yes. So, so the graph is common to a lot of signals. You need to know the underlying structure, but not the values of the signal. Thank you. Uh, so let me illustrate these two selection and aggregation sampling in just in time. And in time, they're actually the same thing. That's the beauty of it. So say that you have this time signal, okay, and you want to do selection sampling, which is a uniform sampling. So you say, okay, I will pick nodes 1, 3, and 5 to sample here. That would mean I pick the blue, purple, and green values. Okay, that would be selection sampling. That's probably the most intuitive way to extend uh, sampling. In aggregation sampling, we're not doing that. We're doing, this is your original signal. Start applying shifts, which in this case are just time shifts, and then sample from the signal formed by the enlarged nodes here, which are the values that node one sees. Okay, and then the guy, you s if you do uniform sampling in there, you do the same kind of sampling as the other one in time, but in graphs these things are very very different. Uh -huh. So key observations here that the observation matrix for aggregation sampling is a diagonal times a Vandermond that is uh, very, very helpful. <laughs> Appropriate in distributed scenarios because we can do inference from each node and we don't have to pick values from different parts of the graph. Different nodes will lead to different performance in the presence of noise, we'll see that in a second. This is good to do distributed inference. Uh, and this, for example, is Say that you have whatever, in any field that you're trying to estimate, you can estimate that field two ways, right? So one, just putting sensors in different places that will be sort of selection sampling, right? Here I'm working on an analogy, sort of selection sampling. Or you can put a sensor somewhere and then know the dynamic of the, of the, of the system, that will be S. So the guy just sitting there and measuring how the pollution varies with time could reconstruct the original pollution uh, field. Okay? So th this is the analogy that you should have in mind. So some extension that I don't have uh, time to get into because I would like to talk about other things. Something in the presence of noise, okay, what happens if the signal is not perfectly unlimited but approximately unlimited? In that case, actually picking the nodes uh, plays a huge role in error minimization. And non frequency support, what if you know that the signal is unlimited but you don't know it's the first K? You just know it has a K support but you don't know which are the active frequencies, okay? That falls into the category of, of sparse recovery, and in that case, actually, the Vandermont structure can again be leveraged to obtain theoretical guarantees of when you can recover the signal, even when you don't know the support. 
<coughs> and space shift sampling is just mixing the two things, right? So here we said, okay, one way you can go is just you have the graph and just pick k values. Another way you can go is just you have the graph, just sit on one node and start applying shifts k times and pick those values. Of course, you can just pick three nodes and do k over three in these three values, right? Really good idea. And that would be space shift, yes. Yes, yes, uh, that's a very good question. So, so we, we said that in, in time they are the same, right? Yeah. But the question is, okay, we know that in time they are the same. We know that in general they are different, but how big is the area where they are the same? Right? Uh, well, I can tell you that for any graph which is circulant, they will be the same. So of course this cycle is circulant, the name comes from there. But uh, you could have, uh, for example, if in this cycle you also add two hops, but regularly you add two hops, then they will be the same. Huh? Uh, so th that family of graph will be the same for sure. Not sure if there are more than we. Thank you. Yes, yes. So in the in the case, yes. Sorry, finish. Yes, yes. I, yeah, I didn't get into that. So the thing here is if, if you have a noiseless scenario, then with just picking k, right, where k is the bandwidth, let's say, uh, then by picking k, you can either reconstruct it perfectly or not reconstruct it. In noisy scenarios, picking more and more samples, of course, give you better and better approximation. Okay, so I, I, I won't get into how, how, how the error uh, decreases with k, but that's exactly the intuition that you, you need to have, yes. Yes, that's the intuition, yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so here's some uh, quick example to get there. Um, so here, sampling the U.S. economy. So you say you have a, uh, we have the U.S. economy, so we have it divided in sectors, and the Bureau of uh, Commerce actually publishes this kind of information. You have the production of each sector uh, for a given year. So what we did is, okay, we grabbed, uh, so our signal would be the production of the different sectors in 2011. Okay? <laughs> and then using previous years, we know how much production passed from one sector into the productive stage of the other. Okay, so for example, how much went from farms into food industry, right? Quite a bit, I guess. Uh, okay, so b based on that, you build a graph. Okay, and actually, if you look at that signal, okay, the signal for 2011, for the graph built with using the previous flows, of course, it is very unlimited because there's a lot of cross information there. The economy doesn't restart at random every year. Okay, so and here is the uh, frequency representation of that signal, so it is highly unlimited. So, so here we have 64 um, sectors, so also 64 frequency bases, and in the first couple, there's most of the energy there concentrated. This means that by just observing a few of the um, of the economic activity of a few sectors, I can estimate quite well the whole economic activity in the U.S. You see, okay? So I get an expert in tobacco and an expert in leather products, I tell you, okay, what are we going to produce next year? And with those two values, I can actually do a pretty good estimation of the whole matrix of production. See, that, that's ma mainly the idea here. We won't go into details, actually. Uh, then you can, you, can add, uh, you can add noise, okay? Of course, while you're adding noise, you think, of course, it becomes harder. You can add different types of noise with different colors, okay? You can study that. But the thing that I want to uh, <coughs> emphasize here is that this is the error for a, for a given noise level when, we, when you do aggregation in different economic sectors. So here you have economic sectors, the, the, the I know that you're picking to aggregate information. And here you have the error. So we have the empirical and the theoretical, they coincide, so okay, our analysis is correct. That's a good thing to know. But then there, there's a huge variability in the error levels between different nodes. So this is log scale, okay? So if you pick a good, if you pick a good node to 
aggregate information, then you have an error of 10 to the minus 3. You got perfect reconstruction. If you picked uh, an incorrect one, you have 10 to the 2. Okay, so the thing blows up. So actually picking the correct node is not trivial, and it has uh, massive implications in terms of inference. Okay, that's the, just the message. And here, okay, this is just a performance of a little bit more uh, wacky space shift uh, uh, schemes that uh, I would like to go on to the next uh, part. Uh, okay, so if uh, maybe if you have some questions, we can hold it till the end uh, because I am very excited about this thing of blind identification. So here, uh, blind identification, the idea now, it will be a little bit more, uh, have to do more with diffusion processes. So sampling is like a very cornerstone problem, and the idea there was to um, let you guys know how the theory differs from uh, traditional signal processing, what are the points of contact, but also what are the points where the theories diverge. <laughs> now in blind identification, we'll see more of the um, connections with network processes. The idea here is the following. So say that you observe a signal Y, so a, a graph signal Y. Say, how was this signal generated? Okay, let's pose the following generative model. We say, okay, we actually originally had a sparse signal in the graph, X, and this signal was diffused by some local operator here, S, okay? Was diffused by some local operator successively. So we get X1, X2, X3, X4. And then what we observe is actually a linear combination of these successive diffusion uh, processes, okay? okay? Of course, if you write that, it's not a surprise that if you write this thing here, you replace this with that. Actually, the thing that appears here is a filter, okay? because it's, of course, a local operation, so a filter appears over there. So Mainly, what we observe is, okay, let's say that we observe Y, which is the filter output of an originally sparse signal. Okay? But we only observe Y. We don't know anything else. And the idea would be, okay, let's try to find H and X from Y. That's why blind identification. Okay, it has to do with blind the convolution in time, for time signals. Again, a pictorial representation of this. Okay, so we observe the thing. We say, oh, I think this comes from a sparse signal passing from a graph filter, but I don't observe these things. I would like to recover this from this. Okay. When can this be useful? Okay, say that you have a global opinion, so you have a social network, you observe a global opinion, you say, okay, this opinion was generated from a rumor or a, or a pair of rumors, I just observed the opinion at the time point, but I would like to know what was the rumor, okay, that would be the values of X, in this analogy I'm trying to draw here, who started it, that would be the support of X, so that would be finding X, the values and the support, and how do people weigh what they hear to form their, op their own opinion, that would be the coefficients of the graph filter, okay? So that would be more or less the <coughs> picture to have in mind. So more technically, the thing is here, given S, again, the graph here is given, we can talk about the uh, other extensions, but here the graph is given, so we're given S and we're given Y, and we'd like to find X and the vector of coefficients H. Okay, that's, that's the problem. And that uh, extends classical blind convolution to graphs. Okay? So let's see, so we have that Y is equal H times X. We can use the frequency representation to uh, write that in terms of uh, frequencies with Bs and Us here just for notational convenience, write U as B inverse, so this is X tilde, right? Uh, but observe that y, that is what we are observing, is a bilinear function of h and x. Okay, it's a bilinear function. It's no non-convex, but it is bilinear. Okay, we're not that bad. Uh, however, the problem is ill post if we think that x can be full. Why? Because, well, we have L plus 1 plus n unknowns. So L plus 1 unknowns in h, n unknowns in x, and we have just n observations, which is y. Okay, so if we do not enforce sparsity here, we are lost. Okay, we will never be able to solve this. However, let's say that X is S sparse. Okay, so the original signal just had like a couple of spikes here and there. It's not full. So now we will have L plus 1 plus S unknowns and still N observations. So there is uh, hope there, at least thinking of degrees of freedom. There's hope to solve it. So basically, we can pose this as a... Uh, non-convex feasibility problem, where we are trying to find h and x subject to this constraint, which is bilinear, which is just that y equal hx, but written a little bit 
well, complicated fashion, and that the sparsity level of x is less than or equal to s. Okay? We are not in a good position to solve this yet. Right? This is highly non-convex. Well, if you massage this expression here a little bit, you can write it in this way, okay? where you have, a, okay, here you have a Cathy Rao product, it's a column wise Kronecker, which is an amazing product. And here you have uh, this outer product of x and h, so the back of that. So of course it's still bilinear in x and h, we just, we didn't do anything magical here. However, we have this outer product, okay? So we can define a new variable z, okay? Which is a matrix, okay? Formed by that, that outer product. And now y is a linear function of this matrix, okay? It's bilinear in x and h, but linear in z. So right now, we can rewrite this problem as minimizing the rank of C, because we know that C should be rank one, because it's just an external product of two vectors, subject to a linear constraint, now here we're good, and this row-wise sparsity. Why? Because if X is sparse, and we write this external product, a lot of the rows of C should sparse, should, be, should have all zeros, right? So that's what we enforce it here by the two zero norm. So now we have a rank minimization subject to a linear constraint, that one we're good, but here sparsity. So we are still sort of uh, not in a good position to solve it. Eh? But what should we do? We relax. Okay. So then uh, we, uh, basing, basing, uh, based on this property that L1 induces sparsity, right? that's known for decades, uh, consequences of that is that the nuclear norm is the convex surrogate of the rank minimization. Also, the L21 norm is a convex surrogate of the L20. So then we can pose this problem, right? Where we still have the linear constraint. Instead of a rank, we have a nuclear norm. Instead of a 21 here, we just dualize it, put it in the functional, and, and convexify it with a 21. Okay? The 20 with a 21. Sorry. And this is convex. So this we're good. We, we can solve this for huge uh, networks. The, the problem, of course, here is we need to pick alpha. That's uh, not trivial. And actually, the best thing to do is, in the same way that doing a reweighted L1 norm helps you a lot when solving uh, sparse problems, here doing a reweighted L21 norm uh, actually helps a lot in practice. And we'll see that in a second. Well, we'll see that right now, actually. Uh, so here we have some um, simulations. Okay, so. Here we have run the recovery problem for different values of L and S. Okay, so here in these grids, we have different values of L, different values of S. Of course, over here it is the easiest way to solve, because like L1, S1, that's very easy. Over here it is harder, okay? So, and then in the middle you have this gradual detriment of the performance. Uh, and these are three different uh, problems. Here it's just a random Erdos-Reni graph. Okay, here I think we have like 50 or 100 nodes. And this is the value of L, the value of S. See that we don't do very good. I mean, we, here we can recover it uh, perfectly. By recovering it perfectly, I mean that the error less than 10 to the minus 3. This is by picking a fixed alpha arbitrarily. Actually, by doing this reweighted thing that I told you about the alpha, the performance increased uh, amazingly a lot. Yeah? So here we can recover uh, for large values of L and S. Okay? This means that you observe the signal Y, remember, and you recover the filter coefficients and the support of X and the value of X correctly. And this is for a real graph. This is for a brain graph, an actual brain atlas, 66 brain regions. and. Uh, <coughs> And we, we um, so the signals are synthetic, but the graph is real. That's a, that's a thing to know. And here, uh, okay, the performance is a little bit worse than erdos reni graph, but it's uh, still acceptable. And now, and here we are comparing with other ways. So how, how would you go about solving this problem if you uh, were not solving it this way? Well, one way would be, uh, I just do a naive linear uh, least squares solution of the linear part of the problem, okay? So that would be, this is, this is a linear uh, set of equations. So you just do naive LS of that. Of course, that's not a good thing because you're not taking account the rank one of the matrix. And that would be, that would give you the blue line. So here you have error, here you have number of observations. So here the brain has 66 nodes, and here I'm saying, Imagine that instead of observing the whole signal, that means the 66 nodes, you just observe 30 nodes at random. Okay? So with observing 30 nodes at random, how good can you do? Of course, when you start observing more and more and more, you do better and better and better. That's why these curves uh, just are decreasing. 
but for a fixed number of observations, we can compare the different methods. Um, so naive LS is, of course, the worst thing to do. AM means alternating minimization. That would be, OK, originally we had a bilinear problem. So why don't we just solve that by fixing x and solving for h, and then fixing h and solving for x, and doing this sort of block coordinate descent? OK, you can do that. But the performance is uh, not as good as the thing that we proposed, right, which is the yellow one. So the alternative minimization is the orange one. The thing that we proposed, rank minimization, that's RM, it's uh, the thing that we're proposing over here. And the purple one is, what if you do rank, minimi rank minimization, but you know a priori the support of the signal? Okay? That would be extra information. Okay? So here, instead of having this thing, we, we won't even need it, because we already know where x has zeros and where it doesn't. So it will be only a rank minimization and not this uh, composite norm. So in that case, of course, you will do better. How better? Well, more or less, you need double the number of observations to get to zero error. Okay? And that uh, goes in line with some theoretical findings. Okay? This, I want to say, this here is completely empirical. Okay? We're trying to work on the theoretical part. But being in the double of observations ballpark is actually encouraging. <coughs> so um, this is ongoing work. So next things to do with this problem, mainly to enforce the theoretical part. So, there are two things, one thing called identifiability and one thing called recoverability. Okay, just to give you an idea, uh, when we went from the bilinear problem to the lifted problem of the matrix, uh, ensuring that we haven't uh, included any bad solution is there, that would be identifiability. Okay? And recoverability means when we relax the problem, the thing that we recover being the solution of the original problem, that would be recoverability. Of course, the probability is usually set in terms of probability, right? Because we're going from a non-convex to a convex, we won't have guarantees. But you say, okay, with high probability, blah, blah, blah. this kind of this kind of uh, statements are the ones that we are looking right now. Other models, yes, okay, you could have like multiple filters in parallel and try to extend the well, class, classical results in signal processing that have to do with coprimality between the filters, etc. We are working on that. But uh, ambition applications, like we said something on opinion formation in social network, that was the original motivating example, if you recall. Uh, other things, for example, identifying sources of epileptic seizure in terms of the brain. Okay, so when you look at the brain activity during a seizure, it looks like very uh, hard to analyze. But what, what if we model it as actually being original spikes filtered through the brain? Can, can, we, can we explain something with that or gain new insights into this problem? Or for example, tracing, tracing patient zero in an epidemic. Okay, so, so for a given point in time, you see the spread of a disease. We say, okay, well, the disease started somewhere and then diffused through the graph. Can we use this kind of techniques to detect where this thing started, or information cascades, this, this, this kind of things? Great. And now, uh, so just a few concluding remarks and summary of what we've done uh, today. Bless you. So. Um, First, we did an introduction of what GSP is, graph signal processing, some building blocks, some basic notions of it. So once, once, we, got, uh, once we got that um, intuition with us, we went on solving one of the most basic problems, which is sampling. And here we saw that we had this decoupling of the traditional way of sampling now can actually be decoupled into two ways. Okay? So this original, and this is actually a, a picture to have in mind. So original, originally, we had this cycle graph, okay? and we have the space of nodes in the graph. Okay? And the space of shifts that you can apply, actually, there's a one to one relation. Because when you apply a shift, you go to the next node. Okay? So there's no reason to think of this as being different dimensions when you only look at time uh, signals. But when you go into more general graphs, these are actually two different things. You can actually pick nodes that will be in the graph dimension. Or you can actually apply shifts and, and keep picking samples in the same node. Okay? So these are two different dimensions from which you can sample. And of course, you can sample in the two-dimensional space spanned by these two dimensions. And that would be space shift sample, which is the way to combine both. Okay? So that, that picture to have in mind is useful. And then finally, we talked about blind identification. The key idea is to extend blind deconvolution to graphs. We uh, used uh, tools of rank and sparse optimization, lifting, and convexifying. And just a few notices about uh, future research avenues. Okay, so 
There are many open problems in GSP, and actually, maybe that's why it's sort of popular, because you open a signal processing book, you look at the chapters, you say, ah, median filters, I would like to do that in graphs. I mean, people are doing that, but we don't need to, uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, we need to have actual uh, applications for this. So we believe that network processes are actually a good way to mix this theory of graph signal processing with real applications. Okay. So our past uh, work has been in something which we already talked about, interpolation and filtering, which we did not, and blind deconvolution, and some current and uh, future work. So first, the idea of topology identification, and actually in all the problems that we mentioned, S was given. So how can you find uh, S from, for example, input-output relationship of, of signals? And actually, here where you is uh, looking at this problem uh, currently. Nonlinear dynamics. For example, everything that we worked uh, here has been linear, okay, so matrix and linear algebra. What if, if you want to apply sort of a Volterra filter or a median filter, which I mentioned before, this is useful. A median filter, for example, uh, I mean, median filters have been used in images to detect edges a lot. Okay, what, what can we gain from median filters in graphs? Actually, how can we even define them? Okay, these are nice problems to think about. Design of S, so say that S is neither given nor you have to infer it, but rather you have to design it for some particular objective with a given budget constraint. For example, I don't know, you have a, a transformation that you want to apply, okay. and you want to apply that as a filter of the smallest possible L, because you want to make it as local as possible. Okay, so then you need to design S to make that, that um, transformation as local as possible. Okay, that's an interesting problem. And then uh, matrix sketching, this is a statistical uh, problem where the idea is that you have a very tall system of linear equations that you want to solve, but you don't want to solve it by solving all the equations, but rather you want to pick a couple of them. So you, sh you are sort of sampling in the space of equations, and uh, the idea would be if you can use the theory of sampling graphs to get some intuition into this uh, statistical problem. And here, uh, Fernando is actually looking into this problem right now. And with that, I would like to conclude. Take any questions. Thank you. <laughs> yes? Uh, maybe you can go back to the slide where you have the convex uh, relaxation formation. Yes. Uh, so there is still like a pretty uh, rich history of like methods to solve like this kind of problem, like what, which particular tool are you using? Yes, so the, uh, ah, you mean to actually solve the convex problem. Yeah. Uh, it's through the method of multipliers, through method of multipliers, yeah. Okay, so it's like, you know, the things like the, you know, iterative stuff, thresholding, or the single regression, <coughs> and maybe like different, uh, more specialized methods might give better results. Yeah, so here, uh, as I said, I mean, the, the graph we were playing had like in the order of 100 nodes, so anything, even if it's not, Super efficient it would solve it fine. I mean, if you go into, ha yeah, if you go into hundred thousand nodes, then of course you should start looking into those things. We haven't. Thanks. Yes. Can you model time varying graphs? That's a uh, <laughs> yeah. That's a very good question. Uh, time varying graphs. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. That's. Excuse me. Exactly, S matrix start varying, yes. So, uh, so a lot of the things that are nice here, of course, are because the S is the same, of course. And then you have these nice frequency interpretations that as long as you, if you multiply S times S times S times S, then you can just write that thing as, you know, doing powers in the diagonal because all these things are simultaneously diagonalized. Uh, <coughs> of course, if your S, if your lucky enough that it varies, uh, but you keep the simultaneous diagonalizability, then you will be fine, but that would be completely uh, unrealistic. Uh, so finding uh, um, methods to handle varying S's, that's of course, uh, that's something to look onto in the future. Um, we looked a little bit when S is, you know, it's like switching between a couple so you have a collection of possible S's, and you have like uh, this switching. So we haven't got anything uh, very useful there, but uh, but definitely it's a useful direction to look into. Yes, thanks. So actually related to that, can you talk a little bit more about the problem of identifying S-homogeneous graphs, which is one of your future? 
<laughs> uh, yes, I can. So <coughs> let's see. So this is topology identification. Yeah. So here, of course, it depends a lot of on how you um, how you pose how you pose the problem. So talking about how to solve it without even a clear uh, formulation would be too much in the air. So here I can tell you about one particular interesting application, and if you want, we can talk more you know, offline. <coughs> and one particular, uh, the, and the particular, this particular application is actually has to do more with the, with the design of S. If you if you bear with me, uh, if you and it has to do with the thing that I said before that trying to implement filters in a local way. Yeah. So. It, it can be shown that the best way to implement a filter is to have that your H and S to be simultaneously diagonalizable. That will give you the, so if you are close to simultaneously diagonalizability, that will give you a good uh, performance when applying this filter locally. So one thing that you can do, and so we're actually working right now, is, okay, I, I have this transformation that I want to apply. I, I know the transformation a priori, the transformation I'm interested in, but I don't know in which graph to apply it. So what you can do is look at the eigenvectors of this, and then try to look for graphs whose bases are similar to these eigenvectors. Okay? So that can be posed actually as an optimization problem and can be relaxed, and we are getting some successful results into that direction. Thanks. Thank you.